So uh, welcome uh, to our the second of, of five planned uh, public events for our Race in the American Story uh, Zoom Posium. Uh, for those of you who don't know me or weren't here for our first event, I'm Adam Seagrave. I'm the co-director of the Race in the American Story project, along with Stephanie Shanakan. Uh, and uh, many of you know Stephanie, you can wave Stephanie there. Um, so uh, we, uh, we started the project uh, in 2016 in, at the University of Missouri uh, as colleagues there. Uh, as, uh, and as Missouri was once again the uh, epicenter, uh, really an epicenter for uh, the struggle for racial justice and equality uh, as it had been at, at various times in American history. Um, and so we started a the project there uh, and uh, with a course at the center of it and an annual symposium uh, where we uh, get together our students and our faculty to, uh, to share conversations and thoughts and perspectives on uh, the readings and uh, the historical uh, uh, conversations that form the center of, of our course. And, uh, but this year, of course, uh, we couldn't get together in person, which was scheduled to be held uh, in Memphis, uh, Tennessee at the uh, National Civil Rights Museum. And Aaron was gonna join us there uh, in person of course, we, uh, we had to uh, put that off. We're planning on uh, going to Memphis next year, but uh, we shifted to a Zoomposium, uh, all of our events through Zoom. We had our first event uh, two weeks ago. Uh, it was on um, Thomas Jefferson's story. We had uh, professors Peter Onif and Annette Gordon-Reed uh, as our guests at, uh, for that event. That's now up on YouTube, so you can uh, go actually and see uh, that conversation. A very interesting, enlightening, uh, excellent conversation. It's also up on our website, uh, raceintheamericanstory.org. Uh, we have a, a page dedicated to our symposium events, and uh, all of our events are up there, uh, along with the YouTube link to uh, the uh, April 3rd event on, on Thomas Jefferson. Um, so um, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, so I want to thank our guests. I want to thank uh, Aram and uh, Scott for joining us. I think uh, Stephanie's going to uh, introduce them here in a second. Um, and uh, I also want to encourage you to check out our Twitter uh, and tweet at us. Uh, it's at race underscore a mayor story. That's A-M-E-R-S-T-O-R-Y. So please follow us on Twitter um, and uh, be involved with us there. Uh, so uh, with that, maybe I'll turn it over to uh, Stephanie to introduce our guests. Yes, happy to do that. Um, so again, welcome everyone. Um, really thrilled to be on this on this um, journey with Adam and I see some of our colleagues from Mizzou there. Um, I see Rudy um, over there. I see April Langley is is in as well. Um, and so this is this is a, a, an event or a program, a project that we're all really excited and. Um, uh, committed to. Um, so I'm going to introduce our two speakers, but to, to um, also remind everyone, and we'll come back to this at the end of the session, that um, we will also be um, having another session tomorrow on race and American music, which I'm totally excited about because I'm, a, I'm an ethnomusicologist. Um, but this is also something that this topic this for this afternoon um, race and American sports is, I think, something that um, I know so many pe people have been thinking about. We have um, had lots of conversations in class about race and American sports. And so um, we're really thrilled to have our two guests today to help us work through um, how to think about the issues that are continuing to be raised um, in terms of this, of this topic. Um, so again, we have lots of students in, in the room who will be asking questions um, later. So um, our two guests are Aram Gutsuzian and Scott Brooks. Um, Aram is um, chair of the Department of History at the University of Memphis. Um, he holds a PhD in history from Purdue University, which really annoys me, Aram, because I went to Indiana. Um, so, so we are... We are rivals, um, but, but new, very um, new friends. 
Um, so we'll put the rivalry behind us. Um, his, his area of research is race, politics, history, and culture. Um, his classes include civil rights movement, American history, African American history. Um, he's written lots of articles and book and book chapters on um, topics like Wilch Chamberlain, um, Wilma Rudolph, Muhammad Ali, Sidney Poitier, um, and the civil rights movement. Um, his books include um, the men. Uh, the Man and the, Mo and the Moment, The Election of 1968, and The Rise of Partisan Politics in America, um, which was published in 2019. Um, another book, Down to the Crossroads, Civil Rights, Black Power, and the Meredith March Against Fear in 2014. Um, for our purposes, his book, King of the Court, Bill Russell and the B Basketball Revolution, was published in 2010, and he's also published books on Sydney. Poitier and the Hurricane of 1938. Um, of his book, King of the Court, um, Bill Russell and the Basketball Revolution, a reviewer in Journal of Sports History wrote, Gutsuzian has seemingly read every book, newspaper article, archival document, and magazine piece on or by Bill Russell, as well as hundreds of other pieces surrounding the game and the era in which Russell played. Um, he, the, re, the reviewer also goes on to talk about how extensive and um, expansive the work is in terms of all the interviews that Aram did for that book project. So we're really excited to have Aram Good, Good Susian. Our other speaker um, is my friend and brother, Scott N. Brooks, who was uh, my, my colleague in, at the University of Missouri. I always um, blame him for the fact that I'm a chair right now, a chair of a department. He was one of my colleagues who, who told me I could do it. Um, and so I did. Um, he's the he, he is an associate professor at the T. Denny Sanford School of Social and Family Dynamics at Arizona State University. Um, he's also director of research at ASU's um, Global Sports Institute, um, which is uh, an institute that's doing big things. I'm sure he might, he'll tell us a little bit more about that. Um, his PhD is in sociology from the University of Pennsylvania. He's interested in youth, sports, coaching, um, leadership. Um, I also know he's interested in, in sort of black relationships and black love as well, but he doesn't say this. It's not said anywhere on any of the websites, but, but I know that our students at, at, at Mizzou really enjoyed that part of his research as well. He's consulted with the NFL, MLB, college coaches, high school coaches. Um, he's written articles on Magic Johnson, the Laker dynasty, Serena Williams, um, the black athlete, Philadelphia, which is where he got his PhD, um, black males dominating sports and so on. Um, he's written several books as well, including Black Men Can't Shoot, 2009, um, in the, um, the journal Contemporary Sociology, a reviewer said, this book is a rare behind the scenes case study of the inner workings and realities of the developmental wing of the basketball industry. The book's obvious strength is its vivid documentation of the social milieu of elite youth basketball and how that world is experienced and understood by its most active while easily overlooked participants and potential beneficiaries. And so um, Scott is a, is a gifted ethnographer and of, of course that comes into everything he, he does in terms of bringing us detail and nuance. So um, Aram and Scott, welcome to Race on the American Story. We're pleased to have you. Pleased to be here. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Pleasure. All right. So I think um, we're going to start with Aram is going to uh, say, say um, give a few remarks and then Scott will do the same and then we'll open it up for, for questions. So um, Adam, is that, the, is that the plan? Yes, yeah, so uh, yeah, so uh, Aaron, uh, if you'd like to go first, I think we have, you have some slides that we'll queue up and, and share. So if you're Great. ready to go, uh, Susan, can you uh, uh, cue this for us? There we go. Okay, ready to go? Ready. Right. Well, thank you. 
everyone for joining us. Um, it's my honor to, to be uh, talking to you today. Uh, I appreciate it. My, my general topic is going to be for the next 20, 25 minutes is going to be about the black athlete in the civil rights movement. And I'll try to take you from the late 19th century to about the year 1968. And Professor Brooks will help to pick up from there. I want to say thank you to Stephanie and to Adam and to Susan for inviting me and, and letting me be a part of this. Special shout out to the UMass group. I am a, uh, I got my master's in history from UMass Amherst back in 1997. <laughs> uh, and I also want to say my regrets that we're not doing this in Memphis right now. Um, I'm very pleased to hear that you, that the race in the American story is coming back uh, next year to Memphis. I think it's a, it's a special city, uh, particularly for this theme in this story and the, and the National Civil Rights Museum is a special place. Uh, so I'm excited to, to hear that news. Okay. Susan, could you go to the next slide, please? Okay. Um, I want to just start by trying to ground us in some of the major subject material, right? The, the first idea is that race matters, right? That the, that the civil rights movement has had an important impact on American society. Uh, and I think that is something that if you're taking this course and, and, and you're here today, you already have a good appreciation for, right? Uh, we tend to think of the civil rights movement as inherently a political story, right? About the battle for citizenship. Uh, and of course it is that. Uh, but it's also something else. Uh, it's also in a lot of ways about the infusion of African-American culture into the American mainstream. Uh, and you'll be hearing from my friend Charles Hughes about music and its role in that. Uh, and sport is another avenue into that. Uh, sport is a really key lens into society. So race matters, but sports matter too, right? Sports is a big business. We have billion dollar franchises. Sports is an arena of international politics. Think about like the 1936 Olympic Games, which were a showcase for Hitler's Nazi regime, or the 1980 and 1984 Olympics, which were pawns in the battle over the Cold War. Uh, sports is a lens into uh, gender roles, right? If you think about the, the impact of Title IX and, 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 and the, the role of women's history. Uh, construction of masculinity through things like college football or through boxing. Sports is about culture. It's about how we live, the meanings we assign to things. We mediate that through our various technologies, radio, television, internet. Uh, we envision it through celebrities. Uh, you know, we read a lot into important sports figures, whether that's Babe Ruth or Billie Jean King or Michael Jordan. Even people have likened sport to art for, the, for its creation of, of a natural drama or to religion for the way that it binds people together and creates rituals. So sports matter, right? Um, and sport is, of course, Im important in the African-American story. You know, in, if, I, I, on the slide, you have a few figures from uh, the 1890s. Uh, one is Major Taylor, who was uh, one of the, probably the preeminent American cyclist of the decade. Uh, another is Peter Jackson, who was an Australian boxer uh, who was outstanding. The third is a champion jockey named Isaac Murphy. And each in his own way, right, uh, they were showing that sport offered an avenue of participation into American life for African Americans, right? This is a generation or two removed from slavery. But at the same time, in each, in each case, Jim Crow or racial prejudice served to restrict their opportunities. Uh, Major Taylor, for instance, was banned from participating in the major U.S. cycling organization and had to move to Paris to compete. Uh, Peter Jackson was a was never able to get a title bout with the champion at the time. It was John L. Sullivan bec simply because of the color of his skin. Uh, Isaac Murphy, after he lost a few races, was uh, attacked by the press for being a typical black lazy drunk. So sport provided opportunities, but at the same time, race was constricting the ability uh, for them to truly achieve equality uh, in that realm. Susan, can you go to the next slide, please? So segregation, prejudice, right? These are driving the, the means of participation into sport. Uh, so how can blacks respond in that, in that situation? One way is to build your own institutions, and Negro League Baseball is sort of a classic example of that. It's particularly a function of the Great Migration, starting in World War I in the 1920s, when more African Americans were congregating in cities. So like when the National Negro Leagues begin in the 1920s, you know, the teams are in Baltimore and Indianapolis and St. Louis and Chicago and cities that are at the heart of the Great Migration. Uh, and they show black strength within a segregated economy in a lot of ways, right? The, the owners are black, the stars are naturally black, but the Negro Leagues is also in a lot of ways the function of the oppressive nature of segregation. Uh, the teams have to barnstorm, they, they travel around uh, to, to make ends meet. Uh, they, have, they get very uneven media coverage. They play irregular schedules. Players often jump from team to team. So, so Jim Crow, even as it creates the opportunity of the Negro Leagues is also constricting the, the possibilities for its growth. 
Another key way to think about race in, in historic terms in American sport is through the athletes as racial symbols, right? And perhaps the first black athlete to really galvanize American public opinion in the 20th century was the boxer Jack Johnson. Uh, in a lot of ways, Jack Johnson was white people's nightmare of what a black athlete could be. Uh, he lived the life of what was referred to at the time as the life of a sport. And that meant that you patronized saloons, you drank, you gambled, uh, you slept with women, prostitutes, including white women, uh, in the case of Jack Johnson. Uh, and he was able to win the heavyweight title by uh, beating an Australian named uh, Peter Burns in 1908. And that lured the uh, the past champion, Jim Jeffries, out of retirement in 1910. And they fought on July 4th of 1910. And Jack and Johnson trounced him. In the, in the aftermath, there were riots in many American cities, white mobs attacking into black neighborhoods as sort of a revenge for, for Jack Johnson capturing uh, the title. And Johnson continued to sort of parade his lifestyle. He lived unapolog unapologetically. Uh, and that ultimately uh, served again as his downfall. In 1915, he was prosecuted under something that was called the Mann Act, which was designed to, pr to uh, prohibit uh, uh, taking prostitutes across state lines. But it was usually used for child slavery. Uh, but it was used to, to prosecute Johnson because he was doing this with white. So Joe Lewis, the next great black champion of the early of the first part of the 20th century when he uh, emerged in the 1930s his image was constructed in the exact way to be the opposite of jack johnson uh, so he rises uh, in 1935 that's when he meets when he beats max bear and primo carnera and establishes himself as one of the great fighters of his generation um and then he beats jim braddock for the heavyweight title in 1937. his sort of marketing team so to speak at the time is very conscious of the way that they present Joe Lewis. And they are part of the reason that he's sort of presented as this great champion is because he is not Jack Johnson. He is polite, he is humble, he is soft-spoken. He's never photographed with liquor bottles or, or, or with women besides his wife. Um, he refuses to pitch liquor, he refuses to endorse tobacco. Uh, the, white, the white media at the time often referred to him as quote, a credit to his race. Of course, he was also embraced as a folk hero by African Americans. Uh, he was the heavyweight champion is, you know, had this enormous status at, at, in the era, and it was seen as sort of the, the highest level of manhood, the highest level of, act, of athletic achievement you could have. And if Joe Lewis is the heavyweight champion, then that, that read enormous significance into that. So in African American circles, when Joe Lewis won, it was, it, he lifted up everyone. When Joe Lewis lost, it was a, it was a crushing defeat for everyone. If you've ever read uh, Why the Cage Bird Sings by Maya Angelou, for instance, there's some glorious passages in there about uh, listening to Joe Lewis's fights on the radio as a young child in, rural, in the rural South. The pattern of Joe Lewis is also reinforced by Jesse Owens, the great Olympic champion. In 1936, uh, Jesse Owens wins four gold medals at the uh, so-called Nazi Olympics, the ones held in Berlin to showcase the Nazi regime. Um, and of course, here's an African-American man serving as a symbol of American democracy in contrast to the fascist regime of Nazi Germany. Right? Uh, and it's a, the, the myth of, of Jesse Owens gets reinforced, particularly by a story that develops that actually isn't true, uh, that he was snubbed by Adolf Hitler on the medal stand. Um, so he becomes this sort of great example of American achievement. But here's this African-American doing so. He's even getting uh, positive press coverage in the, in, the, in, the, in the South, white papers in the South. Are, are putting Jesse Owens on the front page in ways that would have been deemed unimaginable for, for a political figure. Owens, like Lewis, is this safe symbol. He's humble, he's soft-spoken, he gives credit to his white mentor. He's a political moderate. They're both college, or he's college educated. Uh, so in all these ways, you know, Lewis and Owens are kind of setting the pattern for the civil rights era, uh, for what a black icon can and should be. Susan, next slide, please. And that icon is particularly seen through Jackie Robinson, through the, you know, the sort of the galvanizing public figure in terms of black sports after World War II. Remember, Major League Baseball had been segregated since the late 19th century, uh, whereas Jim Crow laws were going into place uh, throughout American society. Uh, there was the, the last blacks were sort of filtered out of Major League Baseball. And integration, post-World War II required sort of a big change in racial consciousness. And Jackie Robinson sort of stood at the forefront of that. It was, this was in the midst of the early Cold War, uh, the intensified Great Migration, and Jackie Robinson sort of coalesced all these forces together. Why Jackie Robinson? He was not the best 
black baseball player in 1946 or 1947 when, when Branch Rickey, the uh, president of the Brooklyn Dodgers, selected him as this sort of what was known as the great experiment. But he was the best symbol, the best icon, the best image. He uh, was college educated at UCLA, where he was a, a multi-talented sports star. He was a World War II veteran, got an honorable discharge. He's very smart. Uh, he's married, so that diffuses any type of sexual threat a la Jack Johnson. And Branch Rickey was very, the, again, the president of the Brooklyn Dodgers, who was very conscious about choosing Robinson. The, their fa at their famous first meeting, uh, Rickey's sort of recurring theme was, does Robinson have the ability to not fight back when he, is, uh, when he hears catcalls from white players or, or to get spiked by, by uh, a, white, uh, a white rival? He wanted a player with the discipline to not fight back, to sort of embody this image of nonviolence. Uh, and Ricky is very conscious in, in the lead-up. You know, uh, uh, Robinson spends a year in the minors in 1946 before he integrates in 1947. And uh, ultimately, Ricky has to trade a few white Southern players who object to playing with him. There were rumors that were later substantiated that a number of black, uh, sorry, a number of white Southerners who played Major League Baseball were considering a boycott of Jackie Robinson playing. But he joins the majors, and it's, of course, this incredible success story. Uh, the team is outstanding uh, in Robinson's era from 48 to 54. They're one of the best teams in baseball. It's good for the box office. He draws you know, new crowds in, into Ebbets Field in Brooklyn. Uh, it's inspiring this larger black pride. Uh, you know, Jack Robinson becomes Black America's player, and the Brooklyn Dodgers become Black America's team. Uh, but he also is appealing to many whites as well, right? And that's that icon, again, that, that, uh, that I suggest. That wasn't necessarily natural to Jackie Robinson. He was a, he's an outspoken, aggressive person. Uh, and he, after a few years when he was in Major League Baseball, he, he was sort of, um, he was relaxed of sort of some of these strictures and he would, he would, uh, he would fight if, if, if someone got in his face. He, if he got spiked, he would, he would, uh, he would, he would respond. If, a, if an umpire thought it was treating him unfairly, he would say something. And he remained this fiery person, but he, but he was very conscious in those early years of, of having to live by Ricky's dictum. So Johnson, so sorry, Robinson in, uh, integrates the major leagues and he's followed by a flood of great black ball players. Uh, Roy Campanella, Don Newcomb, Willie Mays, Satchel Paige, et cetera. Um, and of course he becomes this great symbol. He also helps to, you know, one of the ironies of this racial integration is that it helps lead to the decline of the Negro Leagues. Uh, there are only a few teams left by the 1950s and they're just basically barnstorming. So that shows, you know, in some ways the racially segregated economy that existed prior uh, is also eroding at this time. Susan, can you go to the next slide, please? I want to highlight one particular moment in Robinson's career. Uh, and this is a, a political moment rather than a ball playing moment. This is in 1949. Uh, the figure at the top of your slide is a man named Paul Robeson. Uh, Paul Robeson was a famous actor and singer. Uh, he was actually, he was an athlete in the 1920s he, at, at Rutgers. He was a star of college football. Uh, but by the 1940s, uh, as the rest of the nation seems to be drifting in the opposite direction into an anti-communist framework uh, in, in the early Cold War, Robeson had taken some visits to uh, the Soviet Union and was impressed by the, uh, the status of African Americans uh, and the, and the anti-racist um, ethos uh, of the Communist Party. And he became kind of an outspoken supporter of eroding the Cold War. And he says, that it, you know, uh, he gives this statement at a Paris peace conference that, quote, it's unthinkable that American Negroes would go to war on behalf of those who have oppressed us for generations against a country which in one generation has raised our people to the full dignity of mankind. So this caused a big public uproar, and he's called before the House Un-American Activities Committee, uh, which was a committee that had formed, I think, in 1941, but post-World War II really became a means of trying to prosecute those who were seen, who were seen as, as pro-communist. Uh, so this group, HUAC, uh, investigated, for instance, the Hollywood and the film industry, among others. So they call Robeson to testify before HUAC, and as a counter, they invite Jackie Robinson to speak. Why Jackie Robinson? He's a World War II veteran, he's a patriot, he's anti-communist. In Robinson's full statement, he talks about the, uh, the injustice of Jim Crow, about the sort of the foolishness of having uh, he or Paul Robeson serve as a stand-in for all of black America. But he also does renounce Robeson's statement. He says, uh, African-Americans, quote, do their best to help their country stay out of war. If unsuccessful, they do their best to help the country win the war against Russia or any other enemy of the peace. 
the public reaction to this is really telling because you know, the media focused just on this statement that I have on the slide here, the part where he talked about that he would reaffirm American support, African American support uh, in the Cold War. And Robinson's received a lot of uh, positive press and a lot of positive mail uh, for this as a result. Meanwhile, Robeson's status sunk. The next month after this, after the HUAC testimony, uh, Robeson was giving a concert in Peekskill, New York, and there was a, uh, there was violence there, a so called Peekskill riot, because there were protesters who didn't want him to perform. Uh, eventually, the State Department rescinded his passport, and in the 1950s, he had a, this, this declining status uh, as a celebrity. So there's some lessons here, right? A black athlete is celebrated if they can reassure whites of the larger black faith in American democracy. That's and that's Jackie Robinson, right? But there's this fear at the same time that blacks threaten American democracy, and that's embodied by Paul Robeson. So that's that's sort of the dynamic. That's the that's the duality that is driving the public understanding of what a black athlete can be, heading into the civil rights era of the late '50s and '60s. Susan, next slide, please. I have for you a quote from a book called Negro First in Sports. It's by uh, A.S. Doc Young. He was a black journalist, one of the great sports, black sports journalists of the time, wrote for the uh, New York Amsterdam News and had a syndicated column. And in this book, Negro First in Sports, it's very much a celebration of black sports, not just for athletic achievement, but for what it means. And so the quote I think is really telling. He says, the great Negro sports stars are perhaps more responsible for the ever rising tide of pride among Negroes than any other group of professionals. They dwell in a world characterized by a more nearly ideal Americanism than any other group. Right? And so there's this kind of mythology about sports that, that Young is a part of. The idea is that you know, sports, because it has rules, it has records, it has so-called uh, stats, it has a level playing field, right? Uh, so it's an opportunity for black achievement uh, in a way that doesn't exist in, in any other realm. Uh, and thus these, these, these sports stars play an outsized role. And we can see this in a variety of arenas, of arenas right? The great middleweight boxer, Sugar Ray Robinson, uh, baseball stars like uh, Willie Mays and Ernie Banks. Uh, Rayford Johnson was a great decathlete in the 1960 Rome Olympics. Uh, Johnson was the one who carried the American flag into the opening ceremonies, right? Sort of a symbol of American democracy. And we see it with, with women athletes as well. Uh, Althea Gibson is the first African-American woman to ever appear on the cover of Time magazine. Uh, she integrated the U.S. Open back in 1950, and she is uh, an out the most outstanding tennis player in the mid-1950s. Uh, she wins the French Open in 1956, the U.S. Open in Wimbledon in 1957. And Wilma Rudolph, uh, in the same Olympics as Rayford Johnson in 1960, she wins three gold medals, 100 meters, 200 meters, and the 4 by 100 relay. And it's an extraordinary story. It's an inspiring story. She was uh, disabled for a while as a child. She overcame that disability. Uh, she ran track and, and uh, emerged, she went to Tennessee State which, uh, and uh, became the sort of superstar in, in just a few years in, in terms of women's track. And she was this, had this charming personality. She was probably the first black female athlete who even the white mainstream media, they talked about her attractiveness and talked about her in sort of conventional femininity. When there were, at the time there were all these prejudices that uh, for women, black or white, that they were, you know, that sports could sort of uh, disrupt your, your feminine ideas. Um, so Wilma Rudolph was you know, a very sort of important uh, icon in that moment. So in all, the, all these ways, these athletes are kind of symbols of the civil rights movement, right? And if you think about the civil rights movement as a whole, in the Martin Luther King model, right, it's trying to show that black people have a place in American life, right? That they can stir the conscience uh, of the American people and that can lead to remedial legislation and that will, that will lead to black citizenship. And in their own way, black athletes are part of this, right? But the movement isn't just that, right? The movement is also changing how African-Americans see themselves, their attitudes, right? A sense that equality doesn't just mean you're legal, right? But it also is sort of a, a way to express yourself in, in private and public, right? It's a sense of who you are, a sense of yourself. And that helps, to think, that helps us to think about some of the key athletes who disrupted the myth that Doc Young is trying to put forth. Susan, can you go to the next slide, please? There were a few athletes in particular who had the talent, the status in their sport, and also the outlook to really sort of challenge that old model. Uh, Bill Russell is one, uh, as, as uh, Stephanie was suggesting. I wrote a book about Bill Russell. I found him to be an absolutely fascinating figure. These are people who are, not, who are kind of holding a mirror to American society. 
right? They're saying that, you know, the racism that exists in all in other parts of the world also exists within the sports world. So Russell is sort of a key factor in this. He is uh, the ultimate winner in terms of uh, in terms of basketball history. The Celtics win 11 titles in 13 NBA seasons uh, in which he plays. He wins uh, five MVP awards. Uh, and they do this in the context of an integrated team, right? The media has to show that this is racial integration in action as the Celtics uh, dominate. Uh, he earns extra esteem because of his rivalry with Will Chamberlain, who people read as this great sort of great big black threat. Uh, and Russell is sort of the defender at the gates in that, in that situation. But at the same time, Russell has a public persona, which is very critical of this myth of sports. Um, in the, in he, he's interviewed for this uh, article in uh, Saturday Evening Post in 1964, in which he talks about, he says famously, I owe the public nothing. He talks about how he no longer signs autographs, how he ignores fans, because he doesn't owe them anything beyond what he does on the court, that he wants them to, that, he, that he, he's very much frustrated by this idea that people would cheer for him, um, on the court, but then still treat him uh, as a second-class citizen beyond that. So he shuts himself off. He also assumes direct involvement in the civil rights movement. He participates in the March on Washington in 1963. In 1964, he goes down to Mississippi in the middle of Freedom Summer to conduct uh, basketball clinics for both black and white children. He takes controversial political positions. Uh, here's a quote from the early 60s. He says, we've got to make the white population uncomfortable and keep it uncomfortable, because that's the only way to get their attention. He even questions uh, Martin Luther King's strategy of nonviolence, and he defends Malcolm X, which at the time there were no black athletes who were doing that in the, in the very beginning of the 1960s, but Russell did. Similarly, Jim Brown, uh, who some, some argue is still the greatest running back in the history of the NFL, played for the Cleveland Browns, had the same sort, same sort, of, sort of uncompromising personality, uh, critical of racist patterns in his sport. He talked about how, for instance, every NFL team had an even number of black players on the team, four, six, or eight. Why? because that way black players didn't have to room with white players on the road. Uh, he, he was critical of what was referred to as stacking in which black athletes were funneled into just particular positions on the field, like wide receiver, as a way to keep them from coming to dominate the sport. And Brown retired earlier, he retired in 1966 to pursue a film career. He wanted to live life on his own terms, so to speak. And this just this sort of uh, uh, ruffled the feathers of the white establishment. Susan, can you go to the next slide, please? No one probably ruffled the white establishment more, though, in the sports world than Muhammad Ali. Right? He rose as Cassius Clay in Kentucky, won the gold medal in the 1960 Olympics, uh, and had this sort of, uh, was developing this talent as kind of a self-promoter, as somewhat of, 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 a, of, a, um, of a braggart. He was famous for saying, I am the greatest. When he beat Sonny Liston in 1964 in Miami for the heavyweight title, right? the sort of the establishment press was all against him. And in one poll of the sports writers, 93% thought Liston would beat him. And when he beats Liston, he says, Almighty God was with me. I want everyone to bear witness. I am the greatest. I shook up the world. I'm the greatest thing that ever lived. I don't have a mark on my face. And I upset Sonny Liston. And I just turned 22 years old. I must be the greatest. And the next day at a press conference, he talked about how he had recently converted to the nation of Islam. So he was aligned with the philosophy of Malcolm X, right? And so Ali, more than anybody else, served as sort of the counterpoint to that integrationist icon of Doc Young, right? This is a guy who was, you know, had elements of the trickster hero in terms of his poetry, in terms of his trash talking, uh, his political militancy by his uh, affiliation with the Nation of Islam. He was sexually charged. He was obviously a very handsome guy, and, uh, but also uh, spoke often about, uh, sort of, uh, about how he kind of played with gender. You're talking about how pretty he was. And he was defiant in his relationship with the press and with other boxers especially, of course, uh, with the Vietnam War. He famously said, I ain't got no quarrel with no Viet Cong in 1967. He refused to enter the draft, and that led to uh, the, uh, the, his exile from professional boxing at the, at the peak of his career from 1967 to 1970. It took a Supreme Court decision, uh, ultimately, for Ali to be back into the public uh, realm, uh, which basically said that he was, in fact, a conscientious, conscientious objector of the war. Ali goes on in the 1970s, of course, to have a, a story, a number of storied bouts, the Thrilla in Manila. He fights against Joe Frazier, Ken Norton, George Foreman, et cetera. And, and it sort of shifts his image, right? Uh, and now, of course, he's become, or until his death, he becomes sort of this icon of peace in a lot of ways. He famously lit the torch at the 1996 Atlanta Summer Olympics. But in a lot of ways, that masks just how controversial and just how defiant Muhammad Ali was of America's racial patterns in sport in the 1960s. 
Okay, one last slide. Susan, can you go up one last turn, please? I want to end with the so-called so -called revolt of the black athlete, which was really embodied by this famous photo in the 1968 Olympics. Right? To understand this, note this, this term, the revolt of the black athlete, uh, we, it, the uh, person who uh, coined it was a guy named Harry Edwards, uh, a sociologist at the time at, Sa at San Jose State University, a former athlete himself. And he's very critical of sports racist patterns. And he starts something called the Olympic Project for Human Rights in 1967, in which he's trying to get black athletes to boycott the Mexico City Olympics in 68. Uh, and though the boycott falls apart, it creates this new climate, or it helps to sort of bring to light the new climate for a lot of black athletes. A young black athlete rising by 1968 is doing so in a really different context from one in 1958. Right? They don't want to just participate in sports. They don't want to just want that opportunity. They want a genuine equality. So for instance, part of the Olympic Project for Human Rights objects to the fact that apartheid South Africa was, was given an invitation to the 68 Olympics. And that works. It helps to, for the Olympic Committee to rescind that invitation. The boycott, though, ultimately falls apart because most of these athletes have been training for the Olympics and they wanted to participate. Although some, like uh, at the time he was known as Lou Alcindor, but Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, chose not to, uh, to participate. But what we do know this, the Olympics for more than anything else is, of course, the iconic black power salute of Tommy Smith and John Carlos after the 200 meter uh, dash. Here is a photograph that in a lot of ways captures a larger meaning, right? We can't not see politics as linked to sport once we have this image in front of us, right? And a lot of what had been sort of under the surface, what people like Russell and Brown and Ali had started to challenge, now comes into the mainstream. And when Edwards writes a book called The Revolt of the Black Athlete, it's published in the early 70s, what, part of what it does is it documents what's going on on college campus. The young generation like yourselves, who are protesting the racial climate in sports, who see uh, white coaches and white administrators who are, who are basically maintaining uh, what they see as these racist patterns. So that's where I'll, I'll end. I'll turn it over to Professor Brooks to take us from here. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Arab. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my slides. I didn't realize I should have been sending them in. So let's get it open. So I, I want to start with, and really it's a, it's a great handoff um, from Aaron getting us up to uh, the end of the, the civil rights movement. So what I'm going to talk about today, race ball, um, a concept that I've been playing with um, and how it feels to be a problem again. So this, this idea of being a problem comes from the great W.B. Du Bois. And here, what he's basically saying is that you know, when people, and he's taking, he's talking about conversations with whites, when he has these conversations with whites and they're remarking about racism and how terrible it is, what it essentially is asking is how does it feel to be a problem? Hey, Scott, real quick, um, we can't see your slide. So um, that might, we, we can see a beautiful purple flower, but we can't see your PowerPoint. All right, let me get it to you. There you go. You see it now? Okay. Yeah. So here is Du Bois, is a, a quote, quote from Du Bois in Souls of Black Folk. And as I explained to you, this is the idea of when being talked to about racism what he feels he's really being asked is how does it feel to be a problem? So sociologist Patricia Hill Collins, Patricia Hill Collins talks about a new racism. And in this, in her concept, it's about multinational corporations these multinational corporations with huge control over jobs and media, media having these vast tentacles um, that are largely unregulated with this enormous reach and anonymity, um, and therefore can impact a larger group of people uh, for better or for worse without a whole lot of 
uh, you know, commentary that, that really settles the, the, the debate. And so what we see now is really this question, and this is a, a classic uh, Sports Illustrated cover story back in 1997, whatever happened to the white athlete. And to get to this, I want us to think about what went on in the late 70s and 80s. And really, you know, as basketball folks, Aaron writing his book on, on uh, Bill Russell and myself really thinking about it in terms of basketball, I'm gonna first talk to you a little bit about what happened in basketball. So in the late 70s and 80s, you get uh, an NBA and an ABA that are really struggling. Um, black men were as being coke addicted thugs that were out on the court. There were a lot of fights. When the NBA and the ABA merge, there's really a, a black spot on basketball at the time. And Dr. J is one that the league gets behind as this, this, this hero who can cross over. And so I think of Dr. J as being the beginning of this push for this middle class. And it's right again after the civil rights movement and moving into affirmative action. So there's this idea that there's gonna be a, a black assimilation. There's an ex acceptability that's really being promoted. Uh, one of the, my favorite commercials of that day, with Dr. J is him being Dr. Chapstick, for those of you old enough to remember. Uh, he uses a word emollience, right? He, he's using college educated words. He's wearing his members only jacket. He's got a bag, he looks, he's dressed in, in slacks. I mean, he looks really professional right after a game. And that's the beginning of it. Coca-Cola picked up on it. And Dr. J being in Philadelphia at the time, Coca-Cola had a commercial with Bill Cosby, who of course at the time had this squeaky clean image. And they're in this uh, men's club with dark mahogany and leather couches. And they're playing on this idea of Dr. J being a doctor and Bill Cosby, who had earned these honorary doctorates, being a doctor. So there's this black middle class acceptability. And we roll that into the Magic Johnson era, right? And Magic Johnson with Larry Bird, we have this real race tension that's going on. But you've got Magic Johnson being someone that is also acceptable. He has that megawatt smile. And from Magic Johnson, we get to, you know, the first who set it all off, and that's Michael Jordan. And Michael Jordan really epitomizes this black ex acceptability. With Michael Jordan, you get I Want to Be Like Mike, and that commercial with the diversity of kids, it's not just that black kids want to be like Mike, it's that Mike is acceptable to everybody. Everyone should want to be like Mike. Mike goes on to endorse so many companies, including you know Hanes and underwear, things that wouldn't have been imaginable you know, as we heard Aram talk about with the Jim Brown, right? It's a man, a black man in his underwear, that's, that's too much. And from Michael Jordan, we get a little bit of a change. So you got a, a Shaquille O'Neal who's still on the acceptability, but we move into the time period that I talk about as the thug jock, and that's the Allen Iverson time. And with Allen Iverson, we get a shift. We get, the NBA gets scared, they're worried about whether or not they can continue to attract this white middle class group uh, of consumers. And yet hip hop is taking over. And so AI really is, is more of, of the pivot. And Dr. Harry Edwards talks about if, if AI had been around in the 60s, he would have been someone else, just like the John Carlos and the Tom Smiths, um, who he expected would have said uh, spoken out against the injustices and and really would have had a had a presence and so from there I want to move into the concept that I'm developing um, that I call race ball and race ball it, it has these aspects and this is something that is that is that is built and I'll I'm only going to give you an example of, of a part of it and then I'll we, we can talk more about it in our Q&A but you get acute disrespect that occurs in this context of American sports. Uh, and it's hyper surveillance. And this is for athletes of color and we see it particularly with black athletes. Uh, then there's the Saru and what I find to be really relatively new is a white victimization. So the acute disrespect, 
so many different cases of overt uh, racism that we see. It happens at micro levels, but also at these macro levels. We see it in organizations and federations, large entities are enacting policies or making decisions that have very racist implications. It's intersectional. So it's not simply about men or black men. We're seeing it experienced by black women. We're seeing it in uh, hyperandrogeny, so a case of a castor semana. We're seeing it across the world. It's global as well. So there's class implications, but at a global level, and yet it's still historical. It's not based upon new stereotypes. It's not based on new things. It's based upon old ideas of, of race. So the person that I'm going to use, and this is uh, one of my big time heroes to really lay out this issue of race ball, is Serena Williams. And so this is just a line from um, a note that I'll show you a little bit later. I've been called a man because I appeared outwardly strong. Right. So Soraya Nadia McDonald talks about Serena Williams and says this, Williams shares an unfortunate sisterhood with Michelle Obama. They're both high profile black women who have been repeatedly subjected to racist, sexist insults, suggesting that they're not real women, right? And so I'm gonna show you a couple of examples of what Serena has had to face. And this is even from uh, a person that Serena has identified as one of her best friends, her uh, fellow competitor or former fellow competitor, um, uh, Wozniacki. And here she is imitating Serena, right? By stuffing her top and her, her bottom. It wasn't just done by Wozniak, it was also done by Djokovic and Sharapova. There's this imitation that is to point at Serena's difference, at her body type. There's also hyper surveillance, as I mentioned, by governing bodies, but also by civil authorities. And then this new piece that's public and global, really going back to what Patricia Hill Collins talked about in the new racism. So we, Serena has experienced it in terms of target testing, and this is te doping testing that has been done. And there, we, we generally have thought that this would be random in terms of picking out athletes. And what came back in reports was that they were targeting her, not, they said, because uh, you know, not in a discriminatory way, but because she came back from pregnancy and so they wanted to check to see if she was, you know, using anything illegal to deal with, you know, to hasten her return. You know, she did it, they did the same kind of testing after she nearly died and they wanted to, again, the, the commentary behind it was they were targeting her because of her return. So coming back from injury, it was not, they said, due to her race. This picture here uh, was a, it's a famous picture of, of three men in Australia who are poking fun at her, right? So you get this acute level of disrespect. You see that this is intersectional. We're not just talking about men. You know, there's, there's also this global aspect and it catches like wildfire, right? So it's not just a domestic issue. Then what I call the switcheroo. And the switcheroo is, is also something that I find to be relatively new. And this is a focus on the reaction of athletes of color and not the incident. And what you find, and this is talked about in other work that, to, that where black women have been interviewed in corporate settings, that folks feel they have to use their double consciousness in order to defend their comments of calling out racism or sexism or homophobia. You can't just call it out. You, f you have to defend yourself in doing so. And so the case of Serena and her last incident at the US Open where she played Naomi Osaka. And Serena is, you know, she's given two violations and then a game is taken from her uh, by the referee. And so this is one of the famous pictures that goes around where people really started to look at her and ask this, and here's a cartoonist, right? And you'll see here, it's not just looking at how they have depicted her, right? Look at her lips, look at how 
You know, look at the hair. Look at how they have made her to look wild and crazy and untamed. You can look at the referee who's saying, can you just let her win? And that leads to, you know, this white victimization. There's a question of fairness. And in this question of fairness, particularly as it has pertained to Serena, there's a whole, there's been a, her, as she has moved through tennis, there's been a question of, is it fair to other women to have to compete with Serena? In this question of, is she a man? Is she really a woman? When you go through this, right? So on the side of feeling it, there's the question of, is it really that serious? So when Serena faced this referee making these, making calls against her, some folks said that, you know, she lost her cool. She was too sensitive. And this is a common thing. There's a shrug off, right? That at a certain point, there's nothing that can be done about this. And then there's a question on the other side by white, right? I'm not a racist. And so by calling them out, your acts, they are, they are able now to claim to be the victim. And so that's that phrase that we continue to hear more and more, this question of, or the statement, I'm not a racist, or asking, am I a racist, right? Do you think I'm a racist? And so for Serena, we see this most fervently in the way that her, her competition with Maria Sharapova has gone. And it's been very one-sided, and yet this has been something that has really been pushed in terms of media. So for 11 straight years after Sharapova defeated Serena in Wimbledon, Serena refused to lose to Maria Sharapova. In fact, some of Maria's worst losses happened at the hands of Serena. And you can see this contrast, how Maria Sharapova fits this white normative standard, this, this standard of beauty, right? Maria Sharapova, 6'1". You know, she's, she's very, she's thin and slight. And Serena, you can see, has been talked about in terms of her muscle tone, you know, and being so strong. And Maria Sharapova in her autobiography talks about going against Serena, who was a grown woman to her. Even though their age is not very different, she talked about Serena being so much stronger. And so again, she was a victim. It was unfair almost that she had to go against Serena. Serena so Nadia McDonald again adds, it doesn't take a gender studies major to understand that the standard of femininity that exists for American women is centered on whiteness. Right? And here it, she's talking about how women uh, overall have to deal with things, but being a black woman in this context adds another layer. It's not just um, that you're a woman, it's that you're a woman of color, that you're a woman of a different body type, even as Serena is, and how this leads to problems. And we can see this in endorsements. So for 11 straight years, Maria Sharapova was the highest paid female athlete, even though Serena, for much of that time, was the number one tennis player. And their earnings and endorsements were flip-flop. So where uh, Maria Sharapova was earning greater than 20 million a year in just endorsements, Serena was earning 18 million a year in her winnings and far less in her endorsements. And so you can see how the standard of beauty where women as athletes in general have to do a second shift in order to really make the money that men make they have to do things where they're considered models. They have to look this feminine part, but Serena has been disadvantaged because of her race, her, her, her body type. And so I'm gonna really end it with here for right now. This is a note that Serena uh, posted on Reddit to her mother. And so you see that first line that I showed you earlier about being called a man. And then you have Serena really moving into empowerment. And in many ways, Serena is a part of this empowerment of athletes that we currently see. I am proud we were able to show them what some women look like. We don't all look the same. We are curvy, strong, muscular, tall, small, just to name a few, and all the same. We are women and proud. 
So unlike the earlier forms of overt racism that excluded people of color after depending on them, and then the forms of racism that focused on the natural athleticism, the hunger for success, and the exceptionalism that we saw in the 80s with uh, Michael Jordan and the, the Dr. J's, right, and this acceptability. With Serena, we see a global and insidious form of racism that blends the old and the new, what I'm calling this race ball. It includes this hyper surveillance, acute uh, disrespect, these moments of you know, where people are poking fun and imitating and going into to blackface. There's this switcheroo where you may call out the racism, the sexism, the homophobia, et cetera, and yet then you are called on to defend what it is you're saying. It's flipping, the, it, it's playing the race card, but in sports. You're not allowed to call it out. Your reaction is what it is focused upon. So with Serena, all of the posts around her bad attitude, how she took so much fire away from Naomi, really changes what was going on where Serena if you look at that match and you see how Serena is talking about her integrity that's being questioned all of that gets lost and the focus is on her reaction and then we end up looking uh, lastly at this white victimization and I have seen it not only in terms of the competitors and the opponents but you also see it in folks like journalists so I had a journalist write to me just a year or so ago and talked about, you know, he was a white journalist who had been called a racist. And he was looking to me to, to help him to feel better about why he was being called a racism, uh, excuse me, a racist, and whether or not it was valid. And so this for me is what we are now seeing. And, and all of this really gets at this, this fear of the loss of white athletes. So I want to stop there and uh, get us to our Q&A. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Scott and Aram. Uh, just fascinating presentations, really. Thank you so much. That was great. And so I'm, uh, you know, I'm bursting with questions myself, but I want to make sure that, uh, that we give our students an opportunity uh, to, to ask uh, questions as well um, and, and our other uh, uh, guests in the audience. So, um, we have a number of faculty members here uh, from the Race in American Story Project, our partner faculty members who, who uh, teach uh, students in the course. So I'd like to um, turn it over to any of our uh, partner faculty members, Stephanie, uh, April Langley, I see is here, Rudy Hernandez. Um, do you have any students that you'd like to uh, call on who have uh, prepared questions? Um, or, uh, or should we use the hand raising function? Or yeah, just feel free to uh, students. Yeah, Rudy? You know, I, I don't have any students. I, I had my own question. I, I just stopped being impatient. Let the, uh, let the students go first. It's terrible. Yes. Okay. So, so I have some, I have a number of students who had questions. So I'm just going to um, move to, through them, um, at, le at least some of them. Um, let me go to Andrea. Andrea, you on? Um, Andrea um, is a student at, at Amherst College, um, and they've just had a, a, a pretty um, significant scandal around race and athletics um, at, at um, Amherst College. She, she herself is an athlete. So Andrea, um, set it up and then ask, ask your question. Hi, I'm Andrea. Um, thank you guys for being here. Um, so um, at Amherst College, um, the problem has been with the men's lacrosse team, which is predominantly white. Um, in my four years, I'm a senior now, um, in my four years at Amherst, there have been three racist incidents, one of which was a swastika drawn on a teammate's head in a photo of it. Um, another were screenshots of denigrating and just ridicule of gender nonconforming um, staff at Amherst College, um, all by players on the men's lacrosse team. And uh, the Amherst College administration has not done a good job of addressing those problems and kind of holding them accountable for their actions. Um, and I was just wondering, um, what is your take on that? And how do you think the college can better hold students accountable for upholding standards of diversity and inclusion? 
can start if you'd like. Uh, the one thing that I'd say, uh, both based on uh, the uh, my experience playing sports, but particularly from my experience as a, as a former department chair and sort of seeing how administrations work, they react to pressure. They react to bottom lines. They react to how is this going to affect the institution. Um, so I read a little bit about the press coverage about, about the incident at Amherst. Um, so, and I, as I understand it, the, uh, the biggest reaction from, from some is that the students themselves are not being held accountable, right? That the, that the coach was and the program was what the students themselves were. Um, so putting that into concrete terms, building a coalition at Amherst that would, uh, that, that can challenge them, that can bring more negative attention to the administration until they deal with it. That's the way that stuff gets done. Administrators have to keep positioning themselves in the center, so to speak, right? Uh, and you can push the center through political action. Um, we've seen it done successfully on college campuses. We, the civil rights movement is sort of a, a textbook example of, 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 of its possibilities. Uh, push the center. It takes specific demands and pushing them, uh, you know, really exerting that pressure. That's, that's, uh, that was my, my read on it as, as I looked at, as just by my glance at the press coverage. Thank you. So Scott can probably speak to what happened at Mizzou. Scott? Yeah, well, and, and I want to start with saying that, you know, as, as I see it, I can talk about the Virginia Tech women's lacrosse team um, that sent out a, a, on Instagram, they had the videos singing a song with the N-word. Nobody Black was on that team, um, and they did not suffer great consequences either. So it's not just a men's sport or a white men's sport. Again, I see this as a part of this race ball that I'm describing. Uh, it is off the field. It is or off the court. It doesn't even have to have people of color there. Um, and yet this is the way that administrations uh, deal with it. Often the benefit of the doubt is given where they're being, what we hear are things, this is the shrug off I was speaking of. You get, well, they're just, you know, they're just kids or they're just, you know, boys being boys or in this case, girls being girls. Like, it's really not that serious. Um, I was at the University of Pennsylvania and I remember where uh, some, some students uh, after a football game uh, poured tar on a, a student from the competing team and then lit them on fire. And yet, you know, it, it took some time for the administration to go and find them. Um, so this is a pretty routine thing. And as Aaron said, there's about pressure. When you get to Mizzou, um, Mizzou is a wonderful case of seeing that how a university needs, they need uh, the pressure of those dollars in order to really make a change. And so while things were going on, uh, we had students who had protested for over a year in very silent civil um, protests. Uh, you had graduate students who were, had just been told just a few weeks prior to the semester starting that they were not going to have health care. The university, due to pressure, did eventually change that, but said, we don't know if you'll get it the next year. It was a student went on hunger strike. It took the football team saying that they were not going to play in a game for the university to step up. And so that's after, it's at that point, it was about a year and a half. I mean, there's other pieces of that that, that are terrible uh, situations, but to Aaron's point, you need pressure, you need leverage. And dollars really make the university do things and it and it can be the alumni calling in when it makes huge press and the university looks bad but the benefit of the doubt and even victimization what I would tell you is after this after they are punished you will hear some people saying this was too harsh for these young these young men and that's what I'm saying about how they become the victims of this thank you okay thank you uh Let's see, uh, April, uh, language, you have yes. yeah. So, um, first of all, Scott, Professor Brooks, thank you for truth. The truth that needs to be told is the way that you're telling it. We rely on that. We need that because, you know, all of us are here on the front lines and, and, and athletics is a perfect thing. I think about people like Barry Bonds. You know, it's like, and I love that race ball. When you won't play ball really, in the way that you're expected to. 
and then you come off and you're the troublemaker. You're the racist, in fact, even, right? So I love that. I've got a student, uh, um, I just want to thank you for, for that. I could just go on. I'm like Rudy. I could just, but I have a student scholar, Indika, who has some questions. And so I'm going to ask him to, to step up, one of my students, and uh, ask his question. Are you there, scholar Indika? Take your, your mic off. Oh, hello. 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 <laughs> Well, I also want to thank uh, you guys for your amazing um, speakings. It was it was actually very enlightening. Uh, I wanted to highlight on uh, what uh, like what you kind of said, Aram, on the like the transgressions and the progressions of uh, race, and I wanted to like emphasize on how like it was affecting the NFL. I did kind of some research while you were talking, and seventy percent of the NFL is made up of black um, players. But then um, to reflect on that, 83% uh, of the fans are white. And, um, and then 64% are men. And like they have a big like, um, you know, take on how everything and how the rules and regulations to go. Uh, and my question is, oh, and, and, and then uh, a lady, Penn State University, uh, named Amra Rose, a history and women's gender uh, study professor, had a quote that's had a quote that said, "You are as good as entertainment, but once you have a voice, but you are as good as entertainment, but once you have a voice, I don't want to hear you. You need to shut up and play." So uh, my question is, how influential should their opinions be in the okay like standing up during the uh standing or sitting during the anthem um i can start sure um you know one of the interesting things that uh developed in the aftermath of the controversy over colin kaepernick right was the way that it, in, as a historian for me it in so many ways mirrored the discourse mirrored the way that people talked about race and sport and black and the, and the and the role of the black athlete in the era that I'd studied in the 1950s and 1960s, right? Uh, there was a, you know, there was this, what Bill Russell tells this story, uh, or actually someone who I interviewed who, who, who knew him told, uh, told the story to me through uh, Russell. That was, the first time he came to Boston, he got in a cab, he was going to Boston Garden to sign his contract, and the cab driver started to lecture him on that he should stay in his place, that, you know, that, uh, uh, he should keep his head down, that he should be humble. The cab driver was talking to this guy who just won uh, the, the Olympic game, he won a gold medal at the Olympics in two NCAA championships. Um, so that, that kind of starts to get at the dynamic that, that you're speaking of, right? Uh, and with Colin Kaepernick, right? People, and in general, in terms of sports, there can be a tendency, not among all, but, but among a segment of sports fans, right? To think of the athletes as just simply the commodity that's, that's on the court or the commodity that's on the field. Um, to not understand them as flesh and blood human beings, right? One fascinating dynamic in more recent years, I think, has been because of social media revolution, uh, plus because uh, athletes are less dependent upon, uh, because of labor relations are less dependent upon the good graces of, of one particular franchise owner, right? They have a lot more freedom to speak uh, and, and, and to not be punished for it, right? Like if you think about a LeBron James or a Steph Curry, uh, in the aftermath of the, of the Black Lives Matter protests, right? And the way that they, they voiced some support in, in, those, in those regards, right? That there are, uh, there are gonna be certain new avenues of participation for the black athlete, but that spurs a lot of the same conservative reaction in response that, we've, that, uh, that you saw in the 60s, that you saw in the era of Jack Johnson, right? In a, in a more dramatic way. Yeah, and thank you again, Dr. Langley, for your, for your comments. It's great to hear you. Um, you know, when I look at this, there's a couple of things. Obviously, the, the whole Black Lives Matter as it connected with sport is an example, not just uh, Colin Kaepernick. So even before you get to uh, Caps kneeling, you've got St. Louis Rams players coming out with, you know, hands up, you know, their hands are up and don't shoot. And you had the various uh, poses and positions. You had the WNBA, which actually were ahead of most uh, players in terms of coming out and speaking against the, the police brutality. The WNBA is an interesting case, and Amira Davis highlights this wonderful scholar there at Penn State about how 
uh, in there, while the WNBA has become this woke league, when you look at where they decided to put their money, they did not put it into you know, things that you might suspect. So as much as they rode on being woke, the money that, that was to go and benefit um, you know, any kind of community service projects or social justice did not go towards Black Lives Matter or that kind of thing. It went more towards what would be considered more mainstream of uh, women's issues, which is not a problem. It's just that's not what they were riding on. And we need to remember that the WNBA first were, were thinking of docking women's pay. And then they realized that that was going to be a bad move, that their players were really unified. They don't have the same perks and things that, uh, as the NBA players. And so they were unifying across teams. And that's really a big push that is we don't talk about enough. Um, in women's college soccer, uh, after Kaepernick took the kneel in the Pac-12, there were several teams with, with women who were kneeling and went on to kneel for, for two years. One last point is we're talking about the professional level. The way that I got to thinking and theorizing on race ball happened because I was called in to speak to a high school athletics department. And I interviewed four or so black women, uh, black girls, a very small Catholic school in California. And they were telling me about uh, the disconnect between themselves, their teammates, and their coaches. So coaches, this was a private school. They were recruited. They were promised that this was a diverse environment, a welcoming environment. And when they got there, they had teammates who on the weekends would, on their Snapchat story, singing songs, using the N-words, you know, doing a lot of other questionable things. And when they did not want to go to those events, they were called troubled, right? They were called people who were aloof and didn't want to you know, be a part of the team. They were called all these things. The coach who at first said, this is going to be welcoming and I'm going to take care of you. After they made a few kind of checks to their teammates, the coach again did that shrug. There's only so much I can do. <laughs> I can't take care of, I can't, I can't always you know, come on your behalf and speak for you, right? And so in these same ways, you can see it not just at the professional level with the highest level of athletes, but all the way down to kids who have to deal with this. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I'd like to make sure that any other students who have questions have uh, to ask before we open it up to faculty and other audience members. So if you're a, one of our students here and, uh, and you have a question, please uh, use the raise hand function, um, or also um, uh, you can feel free to speak up. We'll give you a, a few seconds here to, uh, to, to speak up. And please introduce yourself as well. Uh, say what uh, campus you're from and that sort of thing. But, uh, but yeah, please do raise your hand or speak up if you have a question, particularly students. Go ahead, Maya. Good afternoon. Thank you all for this information. I have a two-part question. Um, I am not really a sports person, but I tuned into a few football games in the fall of 2018 for the first time in many years and noticed how there were more black men on network television with commercials with black male actors, marketing products positioned to appeal to black men. Um, you know, it, it was like an aberration considering how TV media, including programs and commercials are usually optically Eurocentric or Euro American. So I wanted to know your thoughts on that and <laughs> considering the statistics that the young man just presented that 83% of uh, NFL fans are white, are, are these, black male optics for black male viewers or are they just like fetishizations of black male masculinity for white viewers? That's okay. part one. Part two, this is for uh, Professor Brooks. I was obviously appalled and heartbroken at the minstrelsy targeted at Serena Williams and it just seems to be a part of this historic kind of Venus hot and tot narrative. But before seeing these images, I have been troubled by um, the nude posing that uh, Serena Williams has been engaged in. Is, are these posings in response to this kind of 
white gaze upon her body as, as being ugly or being masculine? Or how, how, how do you think that those posings might even feed into this hot and tot narrative that she has unfortunately become a part of? So I, I, I yeah, I, I think that in, in terms of the first question that you asked, we have now, it's, it's very acceptable and mainstream sure. if you're going to be in sport to have commercials featuring those athletes. I think that you know, you're watching football, you're going to have different commercials if it's NASCAR, so the sport does matter. But that's an acceptable masculinity within the context of sport. And men are able to, male athletes are able to sell things because of their, their dominance. Whereas, you know, women, and, and this is where Serena has actually been able to benefit from her dominance, although she has to take all the rest of this uh, with it, is because now that she has surpassed, and, and I don't think it's even argued anymore that she's the greatest women's tennis player She's definitely in the conversation for greatest athlete of all time. She is, if you ask me, that now her earnings have gone up. So Maria Sharapova got a drug charge. She was the one found doping. And since then, Serena has taken over in tennis where women are the highest paid. The highest paid female athletes are tennis players because it's a country club sport. It appeals to a crowd that you know, want to, that's going to purchase Rolex watches and, and the like. And so that has changed for Serena. But that, that first bit is just all about the context. You're watching football with black men. You watch basketball. You'll see that kind of commercial. It's, it's acceptable. In terms of her posing, she's had, she's had to deal with not only being questioned um, about being a uh, female, right, the doping part as well, when she won Sports Person of the Year, folks, and there was a huge kind of Twitter storm uh, that asked for a horse to receive that honor over her, right? And, and even that is mind boggling. Um, and then you have Serena has struggled with wind photos and professional photos early out in you know, 2000s, up until about 2015 or so, in, in that time frame, sometimes photos were photoshopped and people questioned whether or not they were photoshopped. And so as any developing person is struggling or dealing with, you know, their body, their identity and so on, she has moved from having to face all of these fears. And that's why that note to her mother is so important she really did feel like she had to try to conform to that femininity and she struggled with it. And so what now has been embraced is the natural woman. And she's really the forefront of that. So, you know, she's now doing, uh, she has a, a, a bra endorsement that is for more full bodied women, right? Full figures. You know, it's, it, she's, she's doing many more endorsements and even on Vogue or Vanity Fair, they talk about the body type being different now. So she's really been on the forefront, but it came at a cost. She had to really deal with all of this negativity. And so that letter there was her embracing herself. And so, you know, I have found her new posing and her motherhood to be so refreshing to see how she is really embracing it, talking about the challenge, talking about she's vulnerable and speaking about having to deal with this, uh, the, the white femininity and that norm and whether or not you fit into that. And so she has really been someone who is engaged with it by saying, I'm going to be me and I'm not ashamed of who I am. And as that letter said, it's not just me. There's plenty of women who are curvy and this is how we are and we're strong and we're fierce. Thank you. The only thing that I'd add to uh, Dr. Brooks's uh, comments, um, I think, he, and maybe reflects a little bit on your first question, um, is that you know we tend to think about you know I, I think what Dr. Brooks was was talking about at the end really was about what Serena has meant to fellow African Americans to people of color, uh, but to go back to your question about sort of the notion of sort of the white gaze on the black athlete right, uh, and on uh, black people on screens in general, we tend to think of it sometimes 
uh, as either an embrace of blackness or as a rejection of blackness, right? And the, the reality, I think, is much more about, uh, uh, maybe to go back to the Paul Robeson and, and Jackie Robinson uh, dilemma, right? It's about containing black. Right. Uh, the, it's not it's not that white people don't want to see black people. Right. This is a tendency that you think about going back to the minstrel performances of the, of the late 19th century. Right. Um, there is always a white hunger to see blackness performed. Right. But it's got to be a blackness that is comfortable to white norms. Right. And so a Jack Johnson pushes on those boundaries and Alan Iverson pushes on those boundaries. There's Serena Williams pushes on those boundaries. Right. Um, and that's what can shift the center, so to speak. Um, but, it, but it's worth always thinking about sort of this notion of, you know, that the blackness is a, is a commodity that is both powerful and appealing to white America, but also threatening at the same time. And, that, and that's a constant push and pull. Yeah, I wanted to, uh, following up on this conversation, I wanted to call on uh, Dr. Stanley James, uh, who had a point uh, she made in the, in the chat just a minute ago. Um, Stanley, are you, are you still here? She may have just uh, just had to just leave us. stepped out. Yeah, maybe she just stepped away. Yeah. Oh, there she is. Well, yeah, Stanley, I was wondering if you wanted to uh, to share the your point uh, about uh, Venus Williams that you made in the chat. I thought it was an important point. Yeah. yeah well, I had it as well. Um, I was just thinking when Professor Brooks talked about um, the work that. Um, has happened in the tennis field for women in terms of equal pay that we have to remember that Serena's sister led that field of tennis to get that equal pay. And um, I think, you know, that that was historic. Um, the other thing is that um, in this time period of the COVID-19 and the conversation that we are hearing now about health disparities, um, I think we are, might want to also recall that when Serena had her baby, she nearly lost her life mm -hmm. to the fact that she had issues. She knew that she was having problems. She knew her body that well. Um, and it took her white male husband to come and say, do what she knows what's going on and that that's the thing that saved her life so i think you know it's race it's class all of these things and we often think that if you you know manage to make enough money and if you're wealthy enough you don't have to deal with the issues of racism but you know, it's, it's everywhere thank you that was excellent points thank that's you. all i had to say thank you Thank you. Yeah. Um, Adam, do we have time for a couple more questions? Yes. Yes. Okay. I, um, one of my students, Naomi, are you are you there, Naomi? Yes, I am. Okay, go ahead. Um, so um, my question was um, in terms of racial, um, like racial discrepancies within the leagues of sports. So my question was, why did it take, or why do you think it took the Red Sox so long to have a person of color on their team? Uh, um, you know, the Red Sox were the last team to integrate uh, in uh, Major League Baseball. It was in 1959 with a player named Elijah Green. Um, and it was a direct result of the prejudices of the owner, uh, uh, Tom Yockey. Um, this was the same reason why the uh, Washington Redskins were the last NFL team to integrate in 1962. Uh, the prejudices of their own, uh, whose name is now escaping me. <laughs> um, uh, you know, this was this was a time, of course, where the the franchise owners had could exert a great amount of pressure. Uh, but by the same token, um, you know, to go back to the earlier question uh, regarding the Amherst College incident, right? It takes political pressure to make that change. Uh, so particularly with the case of the Washington Redskins, oh, George Preston Marshall, that was the name of the, the owner. Uh, the big reason why he ultimately had to integrate was because he was getting pressure from the Kennedy administration because it was in the nation's capital. How could you not have a black player on your team? Every other NFL team has been integrated for quite some time. Uh, and, there, and there was you know, a, a great deal of pressure from the White House itself for, that, uh, for, the, for the team to move. Um, and, you know, the Red Sox could have been, you know, we were talking about sort of the curse of the Bambino and the reason the Red Sox didn't, didn't win a 
uh, title for so long, uh, between 1918 and 2004. But race is a function of that. The, the Red Sox could have signed Jackie Robinson. They could have signed Willie Mays. They had opportunities to sign those players um, and did not. Um, and again, it was direct, directly due to the prejudices of the owner, Tom Young. Thank you. Yeah, similarly, and I, and I think that there's, there's two points. What people probably, um, I wonder if anyone can name, identify the NBA team that was the last to hire a full-time black coach. I'm gonna give you, I can almost do a Jeopardy. Dun, 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 <laughs> Ask the question again, Scott. Which NBA organization was the last to hire a full-time black coach? Hmm. Go ahead. Go ahead, Radiance. That's one of my students and she's, she's about to answer it correctly. Radiance. Um, hello, Dr. Barnes. My name is Radiance Flowers. Um, so if I could take a guess, would it be the Los Angeles Clippers? Oh, you were close. Oh. <laughs> you were very close. It's the Los Angeles Lakers. Oh. And so I think we find that pretty curious. They had Magic Johnson as an interim. They had, they had an interim. Um, and I am a big Celtics fan. And one of the reasons I am is because not only did they have the great Bill Russell as the first black coach, but the Celtics had a Bill Russell. You know, they, they of course, had Casey Jones. They had Doc Rivers. And all each of their coaches win championships. Los Angeles Lakers did not um, until Mike Brown have a full-time coach. They were even behind Utah, although Utah in their previous uh, you know, organization um, name and where they were had a, had a black coach when they were a part of the ABA. So it's interesting how all these work because sometimes it is definitely the ownership. I don't know that people would believe it was the ownership when it comes to the Lakers. Um, and looking at where the Lakers, you know, being in L.A., right, Boston, for Red Auerbach to appoint uh, Bill Russell as the head coach at that time was crazy for him to do something like that. Um, and so it really does speak to how this is pretty strange. Um, I, I posted a link um, at the Global Sport Institute. We recently finished a field study looking at uh, NFL head coach hiring. Um, and so that, if you go to that link, you'll see um, what the stats are. We did a 10 year snapshot and we're going to NCAA Power Five football. We're looking at Major League Baseball. Then we're going to do NCAA women's head coach. Um, we're going to go to the English Premier Leagues and soccer. Um, but these are interesting questions to talk about, you know, who is on the field and then who gets to be in leadership are important questions that we need to be asking. And as Aram says, they do require pressure. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons I think the Lakers did not have to have to respond to this is because they are the Lakers and they're in LA. And as long as they're winning, nobody is really going to say anything. Um, it wasn't until the Lakers struggled that, you know, then you end up with these opportunities um, for, for others. And that's a common thread as well. Um, when teams are struggling, they're more likely to take a risk even if it's very short term, right? So people of color get are the last hired, first fired. They are often, and this is research done by Janice Madden, who did the research that got us to the Rooney Rule in the NFL. And in it, she looked at how black coaches, um, at that time it was only black coaches, were being given teams with the poorest uh, standing, right? So they had low winning percentages, hadn't been in the playoffs in some years, they're given those teams. They're not, they're not given the teams that have been going to the playoffs. They have that hard road to, to do. So great question. Okay, so uh, great. I know we're, we're almost out of time, but uh, Rudy's had his hand up for a long time. If we have uh, time for one quick question and then maybe quick responses from Scott and Aaron, last, last one. So uh, I know we, we, there's sort of talk in the past about the great white hype, right? Or the great, you know, the great white hope in boxing. Uh, I guess I was wondering why we're so in love with Tyson Fury. I know he came back from drugs. It's a great story. But why doesn't anyone think of Detente Wilder as an American? Somehow we're all rooting for this British-Irish guy. 
what, uh, why is boxing like that? To be honest, I don't know how to answer that question yet. I, I'm not plugged into boxing culture at all. Uh, Scott, any ideas? <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm not plugged in as well in, uh, in that particular case, but it is one of the things that I also find to be a part of race. Well, I think we're seeing a lot more uh, a return to the great white hype um, in various forms. I think even when you look at who has been heralded, and it's not the athlete's fault, but you know this is how media pushes it. But when you look at how Megan Rapino has been heralded as, as so much in favor of Colin Kaepernick, and you don't hear much about WNBA and college women's college soccer as I talked to you about. Like that's where this this idea of what has happened to the white athlete is a real concern that is driving um, a lot of this. It goes hand in hand with the fear of of white power loss in general, right? And what we're facing. And so you know, it's not the athlete to blame. This is how you know media and under this guise, right, of, of white privilege, you know, this is, this is what's going on. We're trying to push and redefine whiteness. We're trying to, to fortify it. And that's what the victimization part does. It twists it and now get grants whites some, uh, some new power. Yeah, if you see how much Brady coverage, top Brady coverage there is in a league, what did we say, 70% yeah. African-American? Uh, uh, it, there's uh, it's, it's what's really going on. The last uh, regular season NBA MVP was American, as an American, was Larry Bird, the last white NBA regular season MVP. You think wow. back to how long that is, right? You've had a Dirk Nowitzki, you've had a Steve Nash, but you got to go back to Larry Bird. And that's, you know, that that tells you how cha- how much basketball has changed and, you know, where it is. And wrapping up, I'd at least say hello to my mother. My mother is on. I love that we have this. this term because oh, my mother, mama is on. Both my mothers are on. Um, oh, Mayotta that's beautiful. And, and Barbara, so hello. Thank you all for uh, having me on and, and inviting me. It's a pleasure. I've been a fan of uh, Aaron's work. I, a big Bill Russell fan. I'm, I'm very happy that I got to be a part of this. I'm honored to be a part of this as well. Thanks so much. Uh, I hope that when you come to Memphis, I can help you along next year. I'm excited uh, to learn about your, your project and what you guys are doing. And I think it's really terrific. Thank you for having me. Yes. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you so much to everybody who joined us. Um, Adam, I know we're running out of time, but Obviously, we could have talked about this for another hour. Um, so we are going to hope that Scott will come with us when we go to Memphis next year. Um, and then Aram and Scott can can go back and forth and present this wonderful, I thought this was so well done. They only got together this week to think about what they would do. Um, so um, we're really appreciative. Um, a real quick um, um, uh, reminder to please um, follow us on Twitter at race underscore Ameristory dot um, at it's it's Twitter so you don't need a, a dot com and then um, also um, please send us a, some feedback um, thanks to um, some of those those of you who joined us last time um, we need feedback on our Gmail account so race on the American story dot um, dot com at gmail.com. Um, and then, um, so please send us an email there. And then also to remind you that tomorrow, um, Charles Hughes, who's, who I've been following his work for a long time, Charles Hughes um, talks a lot about music and race in American history. Um, he talks a lot about the um, Lil Nas X um, uh, song that was number one last year. Um, and in, t- in terms of the racial components of the reception of that music. Um, and we have a lot of questions about music and, and race. So um, love Scott's theory about race ball. I'm thinking about race music as well, you know, and what are some, some connections there in terms of, of white, uh, blue white soul and so on and so forth. So lots of things to, um, to talk about. Thanks to our co-faculty members um, who, are on this call um, and to those of you who will join us tomorrow, I look forward to it. 
Adam, last word. Oh, just thank you all as well uh, for coming. And, uh, you know, really, uh, I'm excited that we're able to build this community during this time. Obviously, these are perennially important issues that we're talking about. And, uh, but I think especially right now, I think it's great that we're uh, building the community we are around uh, these important discussions and conversations of these really crucial issues uh, of equality and justice in, uh, in American history. So just thank you all very much for joining us. Uh, really look forward to seeing many of you tomorrow. Thank you.